Lovely. Well, thank you all uh, for coming to this session this morning. I know it's early, as I was saying at the beginning. I'm trying to make this presentation sort of long on stories and pictures to make it uh, an easier one to sort of start the day off with. Um, and before I dig in, uh, if you want any of the information that's available in this presentation, um, you can download all of these slides now at bit.ly forward slash openconci17. And Joe, maybe if you could tweet that out. Um, you know, there's, uh, if you're looking for any of the citations, more information, that's all in very small font at the bottom of the screen, uh, but you can find it there. And if there are any stories in this presentation that you find useful, uh, feel free to download and repurpose it. Of course, it's under uh, CC BY. So uh, this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of engaging the next generation, what we've been able to do uh, at Spark through our OpenCon program. There we go. Um, uh, some of the lessons that we've learned and sort of the, the vision that we have for creating culture change at scale through, through the next generation. Uh, I'm Nick Shockey, I'm the Director of Programs and Engagement uh, at Spark as well as the founding organizer of OpenCon, uh, which we launched in 2014. And I'll get around to explaining more about exactly what, what OpenCon is, but before I do, I want to talk a little bit about why we started it. Um, and that's because, you know, I think fundamentally, uh, this, uh, this problem of setting the default to open in research and education and advancing open access, open data, open education is fundamentally one uh, of culture change. Uh, it's about getting the millions of researchers and educators that are out there to start thinking differently about how they share their results, their articles, their data, uh, their, their educational materials. I don't think that's uh, too controversial uh, a statement, nor do I think the next one is either. Uh, that culture change is extremely difficult uh, to accomplish in my search uh, to find a funny gift to pair with this. Uh, I, didn't, I was sadly unsuccessful, but uh, unsurprisingly, the first like five to ten results uh, when you look at culture change on Google uh, are these sort of like gee whiz business articles about how difficult culture change is, which I think makes, uh, makes sense. It's like they're all plagiarizing themselves, uh, but again, I think stating the obvious that the culture change uh, is, is quite difficult. And in this space, one of our uh, OpenCon alumni from this year uh, wrote a blog post reflecting on their experience and this passage I think really speaks to uh, both uh, the difficulty of culture change as well as sort of how it's accomplished, right? The work of culture change is nuanced. Each of us in our own efforts as individuals and our roles at our institutions and organizations will likely only make small inroads. Uh, at first the work will be a meditation in patience, there will be pitfalls and frustrations, it will be hard, uh, but the sustained and united effort will make uh, a difference and I think, you know, sort of unpacking this a little bit. You know, what to me this is getting at is that culture change happens in the sort of millions of micro interactions that people have on campuses every day. It's getting, you know, colleagues to start thinking just a little bit differently about, uh, you know, first learning what open is, then, you know, thinking about how, you know, maybe it's in their interest or at least not disadvantageous. You know, it's those small interactions that get people to start thinking a little bit differently. Um, the sort of, so we're pulling things up another level. Uh, culture change is even more difficult when you think about doing it both at scale uh, and in context, right? So we're not talking about just doing this at one institution, we're talking about doing it for the entire system of research or for education. And uh, by in context, what I mean is that what open is, the kind of mechanisms that are appropriate, you know, policies that are appropriate, practices that are appropriate, very, you know, vastly. Uh, between institutions and between countries and so you know we're not just trying to shift everybody to one culture of open we're trying to shift to you know cultures of open that are uh, you know contextually appropriate for for their situation and because of this difficulty I think is a large reason why we vastly under invest in culture change um, you know, if you look at the investments that we make to try to open up research and education, uh, you know, mostly it's in things like infrastructure, right, and infrastructure projects like COS or SHARE, Sage Bionetworks Archive. It's in, you know, publishers that are open like PLOS, like eLife, uh, like the Open Library of Humanities. It's in things like advocacy, like the work that Spark does, uh, like what the Data Coalition do, and all these things are really, really important. But, you know, when you start to think about what are the projects that are really trying to facilitate culture change that are investing in people, I think it's a lot harder to come up with, with these examples, and I think a lot of the reason why is because it's so difficult um, to create, create this shift. So, I want to start off with uh, a story of, I think, it's illustrative of sort of how, or how culture change 
happened. So this is the group photo uh, from our first OpenCon in 2014. And I want to talk about this person right here in the front row, uh, which is Robin Champeau, uh, a, a librarian at Oregon Health and Sciences University. And she attended the first OpenCon meeting, got really energized, and went back and did lots of really interesting things. So uh, she, uh, as soon as she got back, started uh, writing a grant proposal that ended up getting funded uh, to create a program called Open Insight uh, that essentially set up a series of workshops, regular workshops on campus at uh, OHSU. She organized Science Hack uh, Portland. Uh, organized monthly series of open data and data science education uh, workshops in collaboration with other scientists on campus. You know, lots of, uh, of interesting work, including advocating for, for policy changes. And so, you know, one example of the kind of thing that fell out of this effort was um, she made a significant impact on an early career researcher named Danielle Robinson, uh, who is a PhD candidate in neuroscience at OHSU. Um, and she wrote this wonderful blog post uh, for Mozilla and the full link this here at the bottom of the screen It's too small for you to read, but if you download the slides, uh, you could get it uh, But as I was saying Danielle is a PhD candidate and you know in this blog post she talks about how You know she had sort of bought into the argument that you sort of need to be closed and proprietary and you know focus on uh, just getting published in the top tier journals uh, but as she went through her PhD work she became you know increasingly skeptical of of that and then early in 2015 she saw a flyer for a roundtable discussion on scientific publishing which is one of those events that uh, Robin put together with uh, the grant after she uh, came out of OpenCon, and that was the start of you know an entire sort of mindset shift for Danielle. Um, and you know, sort of after getting engaged with Robin's efforts, um, she ended up essentially partnering with her to help put on uh, these workshops on campus at OHSU. And as uh, a researcher, talked to other early career researchers and faculty about the importance of open. Um, she joined the organizing team for CSVCon uh, last year in Portland, the conference that some of you might be familiar with. Um, after Danielle attended OpenCon herself, she actually partnered with another alum uh, named Kirsty Whitaker, who I'll actually talk about in a minute, uh, on a project called Open Advice, which is sort of like an Agony Ant style um, sort of advice column for people trying to make their work openly available. Uh, and at the end of 2016, she was uh, named a Mozilla Open Science Fellow, uh, you know, based on her interests and ideas for getting, uh, getting involved. Uh, one of the other things that I noticed recently is that in her Twitter profile, uh, in her description, she likes to talk about how she hangs out with librarians, which I can't definitively say came out of this, but I'm pretty sure that it did. Um, and in talking about uh, her, you know, Danielle's experience after attending OpenCon herself in person, um, she's talked about how it's had a major influence on her career uh, as a researcher. And it's not just Danielle, there are you know, plenty of other uh, examples uh, like Daniela, who you know is, has a story similar to Danielle's uh, about how she sort of got engaged and open through Robin's efforts, uh, and has gone on to you know start doing research. In Danielle's case, it's about uh, a project called Why Not Open Science that's uh, aiming to assess the current attitudes of researchers uh, in academia towards open, with an eye towards improving the efficacy of open outreach efforts. And again, this. You know, originally flowed through the workshops that Robin had on campus, and then Daniela came uh, to OpenCon. And so there's a wonderful blog post that sort of goes into all of these details that Danielle uh, Robinson wrote for Mozilla, uh, but essentially uh, sort of traces back all of these efforts to Robin's participation in OpenCon in 2014. Uh, you know, Danielle's getting involved in those workshop efforts and sort of how that's helped to bootstrap up a culture of open uh, on campus and sort of talking about engaging with OpenCon. Robin uh, said that not only has it sparked strategies for making open science the norm at uh, Oregon Health and Science University, it's also influenced their career trajectories and success of everyone uh, that that we've set. So this is sort of one of the like micro stories, I think, of sort of how culture change uh, happens. So I want to talk a little bit more about this sort of mysterious thing called open time that we're really trying to hone uh, to be sort of an engine to create uh, this culture change. So OpenCon is a conference. It's also a year-round community. Uh, calling OpenCon just a conference is sort of like calling an iPhone like a rotary phone. Uh, it in some ways resembles it, but it does a lot more uh, than just, just that. So uh, in terms of the conference itself, uh, each year we have a global meeting uh, that brings together students and early career researchers from uh, around the world. Uh, and 
You know, the first two days of the meeting are kind of similar to other meetings that you might see. It's a lot of you know, panels, presentations, workshops, those sorts of things. Uh, but then the third day uh, sort of takes the discussions that happened during the first two and puts them into action. So uh, for the first three open cons uh, that we had, the third day was an advocacy day. Um, so we took all the participants uh, to Capitol Hill uh, here in DC in 2014 and 2016, had meetings with uh, you know, Congress people, uh, with uh, the White House, with uh, executive agencies, and really gave uh, the participants a meaningful advocacy experience that they could learn from and then go and put those skills uh, to use back home. And a lot of the survey results, including from some of the people that I've already showed, you know, talk about how having that first experience has really gotten them to think about how it's their responsibility to start engaging uh, in these discussions at a policy level. Uh, this past year, uh, in Berlin, we did something slightly different, which is instead of doing an advocacy day, we actually had uh, what we call uh, a duathon, which is a term that was invented by Joe uh, MacArthur from our team right here in the front row. And um, what a duathon is is sort of like a, it's kind of like a hackathon, uh, but you know, for uh, I guess much broader. Right, it's not just tech projects; it's uh, work sprints on anything from building advocacy campaigns to uh, there was a group that launched the Open Com Network. Uh, which uh, is aiming to produce podcasts and other media talking about uh, open research and, and education. Um, and so this is one of the examples of uh, one of the, the groups in a uh, do-a-thon session looking at open research data as an educational tool. And actually there's an entire website dedicated to the do-a-thon where you can see all of the ideas that came out uh, of, of that session this year that are continuing to evolve uh, at doathon.opencon 2017. Dot org. Um, one of the other sort of distinguishing characteristics for, for OpenCon is that it's an application only meeting, which I totally understand is slightly ironic for a meeting that's totally about open, uh, but OpenCon's mission is to sort of advance the next generation's work on opening up research and education. One of the issues with young folks with early career individuals with students is that they typically have poor access to travel funding. And so if we want sort of the best people in the room, not just those from wealthy institutions, we have to provide significant amounts of travel support and that means an application process. Um, so this is data showing for 2014 through 2016 uh, how we allocated our general scholarship uh, funding. So uh, you know, in 2016, I think we had about $75,000 uh, in general travel uh, support and that was fairly reflective of where we were uh, this year, so uh, the majority of OpenCon participants receive uh, full or partial travel subsidies uh, to participate. So that's the global meeting, uh, that's one piece of it. Uh, we also have satellite events that are hosted around the world. Uh, these are photos from four of the events we had in the last year uh, held in Nairobi, San Francisco, Toronto, uh, and Srinagar in India. and. Uh, we you know, now regularly see uh, close to 30 satellite events uh, each year hosted by a very diverse group of satellite event hosts and sort of take these global themes and translate them down to, to the local level. Um, and I'll get back to the scale of these satellite events uh, in, in just a moment. And then finally, the third and final piece is that we also have a year-round community that's you know, an active email list. Uh, we also have monthly community calls uh, there are two different sets actually. There's one that's sort of a general community call that has you know, policymakers, researchers, uh, librarians, publishers, all types. And then uh, we also have an early career librarian community call as well that really focuses on uh, you know, sort of both, I'd say it's like half and half sharing best practices about how to do open advocacy effectively on campus uh, and half a group therapy session uh, about sort of the you know, struggles and difficulties of carrying out that, that work uh, on campus often. Um, sort of in a, an isolated uh, environment where you're you know, one of the only people really working uh, on, on open on campus. So that's sort of an overview of sort of the OpenCon conference and community. Uh, I want to take a few minutes to walk you through a, a, a couple other examples of how we've seen the impact of OpenCon propagate out, which I think is illustrative of sort of our theory of change for, for creating culture change. So. Uh, this is uh, another OpenCon participant uh, right here. His name's Rashan Karn. Uh, he's now a medical doctor in, uh, in Nepal. And after attending uh, OpenCon, he started uh, a national level group called Open Access Nepal, 
uh, that has since set up uh, chapters at many of the institutions uh, there in, in Nepal across the country. And they've been active in raising awareness about open research and education practices, um, you know, running workshops for both early career faculty as well as more senior individuals. And Rushan actually got one of the world's strongest institutional open access policies passed at Tripwan University, which is sort of the top university in Nepal. Uh, that is not only like sort of uh, requires, uh, you know, sort of articles to be made accessible, it actually carries a full open uh, licensing requirement. Um, that faculty need to make uh, their work available under a CC BY license um, that he passed through that, that institution. Um, and in talking about uh, sort of how he got started on this path, you know, sort of credits the OpenCon community for educating him about these issues, giving him ideas of how he could be effective, and then connecting him with mentors and colleagues to make uh, that work a reality. And actually, I, I got back from Kathmandu uh, just about four or five days ago, because uh, Rashawn hosted the first Asian regional meeting that brought together open access advocates from across Asia, you know, from China, from Indonesia, from uh, Bangladesh, uh, and a number of other countries for a two-day conference aiming to spur collaboration uh, within that region. And actually, uh, for a while, he had the Prime Minister of Nepal confirmed for the meeting. Uh, unfortunately, they had a snap election last Thursday, which sort of uh, deep six that idea. But we did get the National Information Commissioner and the Joint Secretary for Public Health, um, which speaks to the level of policy discussions uh, that they've been able to have in advance, even as early career individuals within that country. Um, so that's sort of an overview of Brashan's direct impact, but the model that he has created in Open Access Nepal has started to inspire others and lead to similar efforts elsewhere. Uh, so Kanuk Manarul Islam is one of our 2016 OpenCon alumni who's actually a librarian in the office of the Prime Minister uh, of Bangladesh. And after learning about Rashan's efforts, he started essentially a clone of Open Access Nepal, uh, Open Access Bangladesh, which looks very similar, but with his position within the Prime Minister's office, even has more direct uh, access to, to the government there. And actually, they brought, I think, close to 12 people to that Asian regional meeting. So even in its first year, has been really effective in, in gaining traction uh, in, in that country. And then uh, just another example that I only learned about last week when I was uh, in, at this meeting. One of our OpenCon satellite events host, Miriam from Jakarta, who's hosted now three satellite events, uh, I believe. And her story is really interesting. Again, I didn't know the full extent of it until last week. Uh, she didn't even know what open access was until she came across the OpenCon application process and then got really interested, especially after, unfortunately, she was rejected and started hosting these satellite events to help um, you know, educate others in her community after, uh, after she learned about it. And those have steadily been growing in size. Uh, and after participating in this meeting last week, seeing the success of Rashan's organization in Open Access Nepal uh, and conducts in Open Access Bangladesh, she's planning to start Open Access Indonesia. And there are now about a dozen similar national level organizations that are propping popping up around the world, um, you know, from, from Canada to Sudan to Tanzania to South Africa to India. Um, it's, you know, it's really interesting to see young people taking the lead uh, in, in this way. One of the other really interesting stories is Kirsty uh, Whitaker, who's right here in the middle of the picture, just a few uh, over from uh, Rashawn. She's uh, an early career faculty member at the University of Cambridge and one of the founding organizers of OpenCon Cambridge, which is both a satellite event uh, that happens uh, at Cambridge in the UK each year uh, since 2015, as well as uh, a monthly meetup group. So OpenCon Cam gets together quite regularly uh, and has attracted quite a community there in Cambridge. And one of the wonderful people that has, or, well, actually, this is the obligatory quote about sort of uh, Kirstie's connection to the, the OpenCon community and how it's sort of uh, made her feel better connected within her institution and given her more confidence to advocate for open uh, locally and more broadly. She's also uh, collaborating now with Danielle, who she met at OpenCon 2016 on that Agony Ant style uh, project that I mentioned earlier. But one of the other people that sort of come out of this OpenCon Cambridge community uh, is Karina Logan. Uh, and we did a survey of the OpenCon community last year. Uh, and clearly, she's doing a lot too much for you all to read uh, on the, the screen. But she's you know, not only got involved in the OpenCon Cambridge um, 
meeting, she's also given lots and lots of talks, which is most of uh, the items here on the left-hand column. But of particular interest, I think, to this group is uh, she led opposition to Cambridge's signing an exploitative contract with Elsevier. Uh, so it just so happened that the library sent out uh, an email to faculty at Cambridge talking about uh, sort of their negotiations with Elsevier and sort of renewing a big deal. And it happened to arrive in Karina's inbox as she was at an OpenCon Cambridge event. And so uh, what Karina did uh, was start uh, conversations with colleagues in her department uh, to essentially lend support to the library to walk away from their big deal contract with Elsevier. Unfortunately, it did not end up uh, working out, but I really like this as a model for how you know we can use the OpenCon community to make inroads with early career researchers and early career faculty, then get them to talk to their peers in their departments and sort of be the messenger for how big deals are exploitative and sort of having those conversations with faculty in a way that's much more difficult for librarians or others. Uh, to have. And then uh, Karina's been super busy. One of the other things that she did uh, in conjunction with Laurent uh, Gatto, also from Cambridge, and a couple of others is start a campaign called Bullied into Bad Science. Uh, and this stems from their feeling that, you know, uh, they, they sort of feel like they're being bullied by their, you know, PIs from, you know, this department officials that they need to publish in these high impact factor journals. Uh, or to hide away their data, uh, or to publish on you know the least publishable uh, amount of of information, and so they started this campaign to really raise awareness about how uh, you know open can be really helpful, just improving uh, how science and and research are are done. And this is uh, right now sort of in the form of a petition, uh, but they're figuring out how they can package it up and make it into a campaign that spreads uh, to other institutions to to raise awareness of of this. Told you there were going to be a number of stories. This is the last big one. Um, so the person here raising her hand uh, is really wonderful. Her name's uh, Guillermina Actis, and she is an early career government official in Argentina. She actually works for their national science and technology ministry called CONACYT. And uh, she's come to OpenCon a couple of years now, and you know she talks a lot about how uh, sort of being part of this community has given her the confidence to speak up and promote the issues that she considers of importance within the government of Argentina. So advocating for stronger data sharing policies, uh, holding workshops, helping to use sort of her platform as a policymaker in Argentina to drive open forward. Um, might be seeing this one coming. That's not all she's doing. Uh, she's working with a cohort of alumni from Latin America and uh, this year organized the first regional OpenCon event uh, in Mexico City called OpenCon Latam that convenes a community from across Latin America uh, to have conversations about how open is playing out in the Latin American context. So, you know, she's not only doing her work within the government, uh, but also uh, more broadly in the region, trying to push things forward. And that group uh, includes policymakers from uh, Mexico and a number of other countries uh, as well. So, I hope these examples are sort of illustrative of how we're trying to use uh, this OpenCon community to create culture change at scale uh, and in, in context. So these are just examples. Uh, I've mentioned nine uh, alumni so far. Uh, there are 700 alumni now uh, of OpenCon in more than 80 countries. Uh, so that's just a teeny fraction of you know sort of the, the folks that that are out there. Perhaps more frighteningly, <laughs> those 700 alumni were chosen from. 29,000 applicants uh, that have applied in the last four years from more than 176 countries. Uh, last year, for this past year's meeting in November, we received just north of 13,000 applications uh, to attend that re required more than 100 alumni to do thousands of hours of work to review. Uh, we actually we looked at licensing college admission software because it was the closest use case to what we needed. Uh, ended up building our own and open sourcing it. Um, so this, I think, is really indicative of the interest that's out there of sort of the scale that we're just beginning to reach. And it's actually based on an even larger effort, which is the sort of foundation of Spark's student program. There we go. Uh, which is the Right to Research Coalition, which Spark launched in 2009, which is a coalition of about 100 student organizations from around the world that collectively represent about 7 million students uh, in over 100 countries. And so OpenCon really is a natural evolution of the work uh, that, that we did launching the Right to Research Coalition. But again, I think the, 
the seven million students that are represented by the members of, uh, of this coalition, again, speaks to the depth of interest there is in this issue from within the next generation. But that's not all. Uh, satellite events are also now where we see more than 90% of our participation. Um, so this is data from 2014 through 2016. I don't yet have our full summation of this past year's efforts. Um, so this, these numbers are actually quite a bit higher than what you see here. But in our first three years, we've had more than 4,000 uh, participants at satellite events that are locally hosted. Uh, we've had seven events across 32 countries uh, and 13 languages. And this is sort of a, a breakdown of, uh, of where that's happened. The countries that are uh, highlighted in orange are countries where we've gotten an application from and the little uh, pins that are dropped are uh, locations where we've had satellite events over the last three, three years from 2014 to 2016. Again, uh, does not have our 2017 data yet, but just to give you a sense of the growth, uh, the last year that we have data for in 2016, we had more than 2,200 participants at those events, uh, which again means that more than 90% of the in-person participation open kind events are at these locally hosted satellite events. So uh, just as importantly, I want to talk for a moment about sort of the second part of this overarching mission for OpenCon, creating culture change, not just at scale, uh, but in context. And to quote Claire Coulter, uh, one of our 2017 alumni again, uh, she had this wonderful quote in her, uh, in her sort of reflection on the meeting, talking about how we must offer to amplify the voices of others rather than speaking for them. And that's something that we've really learn to pay much more attention to over the, the last few years of hosting OpenCon. There's always been this ambition to have it be globally inclusive, but making it meaningfully so is something that we've, we've had to learn often through making mistakes. Um, and so we've, I think, gotten to a good point where you know, we are meaningfully including uh, sort of the breadth of participation in the event. And for example, the planning. So this is data on the regional breakdown of our organizing committee, uh, where it's you know, fairly evenly distributed uh, across geographic regions, uh, as well as balanced uh, by gender which we feel is really important because this is the group that's sort of programming the thing. And if this has just North Americans and Europeans, the event's not going to look like what it needs to. Uh, and then this is data from uh, this year's uh, attendee list, as well as the speakers that we actually released in the opening session uh, of the meeting. And so one of the sort of practices that we've taken on board is being immediately transparent about both who's in the room, uh, how we funded them to get in the room, how we're prioritizing our money, and who's on stage uh, at the conference. And so uh, we did much better this year than we have uh, in the past. About a third of the participants at this year's event were from North America, about a third were from Europe, and a full third were from Africa, Latin America, and Asia, with about 62 countries total uh, being represented across about 180 participants. Um, more importantly, actually, than that is the speakers were actually biased towards Latin America, uh, Asia, and Africa as a proportion of speakers to participants. So uh, fully half of those on stage were from Africa, Latin America, and, uh, and Asia, with the other half being from North America uh, and Europe. One of the new initiatives that we launched this past year that we feel is really important in this sort of ambition to be globally, uh, you know, global community that's also, you know, equitable and inclusive is we've released a report on sort of our efforts related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, sort of what we've learned oftentimes the hard way. Um, as well as sort of suggestions we would have for other conference organizers, other communities, and working to make their spaces uh, more equitable uh, and inclusive. And it's mainly focused on conference planning at the moment, but hopefully, you know, we would like to expand it more. Um, so it's sort of, uh, you know, about two thirds learnings and suggestions, and then the final third is uh, is data on how we're doing. Um, so we've released data on you know, things like the gender breakdown of the participant pool of the speakers of the organizing committee, uh, the regional breakdown of, of th those three different types, uh, as well as the data that underlies it, including things like how we've spent our general scholarship funds. And I think you know, the thing that we've learned is we've made mistakes here, right? Like I don't have that much time to go into it, but like we've made really bad mistakes. Like we, in 2015, uh, I think we, uh, all of our keynotes, we had two, uh, two women and five men. 
the program was balanced across, you know, gender balanced across all the different types of speakers, but we weren't paying attention to the additional visibility that you get as a keynote. And somebody called us out on that, and now we pay much more uh, attention to those things. You know, for regional balance as well, used to be much, much, much heavier towards North America and Europe with, you know, the first year, the majority uh, being North American. And that's something that we've continued to to improve over time. But the sort of lesson that we've learned and that we're, I think, hopefully trying to push out to the, the wider community is that transparency is really important because it creates accountability. People can look at you know how you're spending your money, who's on stage, who's involved in organizing committee, uh, who's involved in the organizing committee, and that accountability leads to change. Because if people are paying attention, if you have to pay attention to it as sort of a community organizer, if the community is paying attention, um, then I think uh, you know, people will program conferences uh, in a different way. And so this report is, you know, an effort to try to sort of use this theory of change to make the open community uh, more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. And I really have to recognize the, the efforts of Lorraine on our team who drafted the report and has really been central to evolving our thinking uh, in this area as well as our, our organizing committee. So. You know, I think if we're going to actually embark on this project of culture change, really the place to start is with the next generation, right? It's much more difficult to convince, you know, more senior faculty that are sort of set in their ways that they need to do something differently. It's not that it's not important, but it's just more difficult. It's much easier to reach, you know, the next generation that's just learning how to, you know, conduct research that's just forming their habits about how they create and share their educational materials, about how they share their data. Uh, and, you know, I think, I hope these examples that I've provided speak to uh, sort of the energy uh, and engagement that's there with the next generation. And this might seem like a new idea, uh, but this is something that's been going on in the open community for actually a long time. Um, some of you may know, but most of you probably don't, that actually International Open Access Week has its roots in the student community. Uh, open Access Week grew out of uh, the National Day for Action for Open Access, which started in the U.S. in 2007 as a partnership between uh, a student organization called Students for Free Culture and Spark. And International Open Access Week grew out of uh, that effort the, the following year and has enjoyed robust student participation since. And even things like the White House Directive uh, that were passed in 2013 had uh, you know, significant amounts of student involvement. For example, the National Association of Graduate Professional Students in the US who has been very active in lobbying for open on Capitol Hill. Uh, and actually in the, uh, I'm not sure how many of you were deeply involved with uh, the, that 2013 White House Directive, but one of the participating events uh, that sort of helped nudge that along was in 2012, a group of open access advocates launched a We the People petition on the White House website. This was before it became an absolute farce. Uh, it was actually kind of useful uh, with the idea being you had to get 25,000 signatures on a petition in 30 days and the Obama administration was committed to respond. We ended up getting, I think, uh, over 40 or 50,000 responses, which was great. Um, but we sort of wanted to also publish an op-ed in the Washington Post calling attention to the fact that this, uh, this petition had reached the threshold and we were paying attention that the community was looking at the administration and expecting them to respond. And there were a group of open access, sort of leading open access advocates that were shopping this thing. But the Washington Post wasn't interested. It's not that interesting to hear open access advocates talk about how great open access is. Uh, but when the National Association of Graduate Professional Students, along with the American Medical Student Association, um, submitted an op-ed to the Washington Post, it was accepted immediately and published in the print edition within a week. And we know it circulated within the White House. So that's just one example, again, of how the next generation's been involved in some of the efforts that you're already aware of, but just might not have been, been visible. So before uh, I offer a couple closing thoughts, uh, as you might imagine, uh, OpenCon's a fairly resource intensive thing uh, to pull off. Uh, so I just have to thank all the institutions that make it possible, some of which are represented in this room. We've had uh, a couple dozen uh, universities and university libraries sponsor travel scholarships uh, for folks to attend again, uh, including some of you in this room. Uh, we also have a great group of supporting uh, sponsors and other uh, individuals that uh, have given at a higher level. And then finally, uh, <coughs> two organizations without whom, uh, you know, with, without whom OpenCon wouldn't have been possible are PLOS, 
uh, who sponsored the webcast in the beginning and the OpenCon satellite events that I've mentioned a few times now grew out of this uh, webcast that's been enabled by PLOS and then uh, finally the Max Planck Society that's been underwriting and sort of the biggest single supporter of the conference uh, from the, the very beginning and hosted the meeting this past year. So sort of in conclusion, uh, the, the final point, if you take nothing else away, um, is that if you sort of want return on investment in the open space, you should be investing in people. You know, a lot of the stories that I've illustrated, these, you know, it cost us, you know, about $1,200 to bring Rashan um, to the first open con. You know, it cost us, you know, a couple thousand for some of the others. Others were self-funded. We just waived their travel fees or put them up in the hotel. But, you know, they're having this experience, getting connected with the community. And I think probably most importantly, overcoming imposter syndrome uh, is what has sort of allowed them to blossom into these advocates. And, you know, sort of, if you can nudge one person in the right way, they can go back back into their community and have you know, a huge impact either at their institution nationally. You know, as I was thinking about metaphors, right, I think uh, it's in some ways sort of like nuclear fission, right? Like if you tweak the right person, it sort of sends them off and then they uh, you know, engage a number of others and it creates this chain reaction that's really, really powerful if you can get it started in the right way. And so you know, I think sometimes a challenge for OpenCon is the people thinking about it as just a, a conference, but it's really sort of bringing uh, a very select group of people together in a very intentional way to sort of change, you know, how they're uh, behaving, to sort of change their behavior and send them back to their local communities to have uh, these kinds of impacts. And just to sort of close, uh, I've only talked about nine people so far. Uh, I haven't talked about people like, you know, Osman, who started Open Sudan, who's working with the government of Sudan to get uh, open policies instituted at universities there. I haven't talked about Heidi Lane, who's an OpenCon satellite event host that's helping lead the boycott of Elsevier in Finland. Uh, that's happened. I haven't talked about Diego Gomez, who you might, might be a familiar name to some of you, but who's a graduate student uh, in Colombia who's being uh, prosecuted for sharing an article online. Uh, and his case has gotten a huge amount of visibility, and he's been an outspoken open access advocate. You know, folks like Daniel Hayat from Pakistan. Daniel actually works in the Prime Minister's office of Pakistan and is using his sort of perch there to promote open educational resources um, through the government and many, many others. Um, so again, this is just sort of a small sample of all the the impact uh, that's that's out there. Uh, I think we have about eight minutes for questions, but uh, if you think of uh, any questions, this is where to uh, to find me online. We haven't announced the dates and locations uh, location of OpenCon 2018, uh, but we will be doing that in the next couple of months. And would certainly uh, encourage you to consider uh, sponsoring a representative to attend or sponsoring uh, the community. One of the things that uh, we're going to be a little bit more transparent about this year is that we really need to establish a firm financial base uh, for OpenCon, as you might imagine, with all the applications, with all the community satellite events, it's a fairly resource intensive operation and one that luckily we've been able to sustain each year based on annual sponsorships uh, from the organizations that I've mentioned. Uh, but there's so many opportunities that we have now um, that we just can't pursue because it's hard to hire like FTEs, right, on annual sponsorship funds. Um, so if uh, you know this is something that resonates with you, we'll be sending more information about the sort of opportunities to sponsor the community in uh, the coming months. And then finally, uh, increasingly, uh, North American institutions are, hope are hosting local OpenCon satellite events on campus. So that's another action uh, that that you can take and sort of bring OpenCon uh, to campus. So we already have a question. Yes out of time, but if you have any questions, uh, happy to stick around in the front or outside. Uh, and thank you uh, so much, and I hope some of you will get involved in OpenCon uh, next year. We'd love to have your institutions represented.